Thank you, Jen, and welcome, everybody. Um, so, as Jen says, I'm, I'm Richard Petrie. I'm the, the CTO at Links. I'm going to run through uh, four, four areas today. I've got a, a brief update or a, a, a reset of um, our operations approach. So uh, this, this is where we typically give an update on outages and maintenance that we go through. So we've had a bit of a reflection on that. I'm going to um, go into a bit of detail why and then present on that. I do have one incident that we, we, we had since the last meeting that I think might be of interest that I'll go into a bit more detail about. Uh, I've got an update on the London One project, uh, which we previously uh, presented at Links 119, if I recall. So we would update on progress for there. And then I'll just finish off with a, a summary of where we got to on the root servers, which is one of the key projects we've been running through from last year into this year. And as always, if there's any questions as I go through the presentation, use the, uh, the codes that, that Jen mentioned or uh, put your hand up in the room and wait for a mic to come to you. Okay, so the operational approach. We, at the end of the year, we had a bit of a reflection on um, how, we, how we present and, and what we go through. And, and today I'm gonna talk a, a little bit, I've got some, some history of, of how the internet exchanges that we run have grown. And, and I go through that a, a little bit about the um, internal metrics that we monitor and, and hopefully uh, what we could start presenting to you on. And then a, a little bit on the new tool that we'll be, we'll be launching. And I think there's a full presentation on this new, new tool tomorrow, but I will just touch on how, how, it, uh, how it can be utilized for the, for the operation side of things. So Lynx, um, we're celebrating 30 years this year. So we, we started off in 1994. We started off in, with one network uh, the London One network. I don't think it was called London One at the time. It was, um, it was probably, probably called something after the vendor that was, was installed on. But um, we had one network, one location. By, um, by 2001, seven years later, we had expanded. So this is actually a network diagram from the time. You can see that uh, some familiar names, or maybe not so familiar nowadays, IX Europe, uh, Red Bus, and, and uh, Telecity, Telehouse were, were part of that network at the time. And so... Um, as, as, a, as a business, we were, we were some, some seven years down the line still running on one network and now across seven different locations, but uh, something like 16 network switches in, in, in the network. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, around 2003 we launched London 2, which was the second network uh, for us, and we'd, we'd expanded uh, across to a, to a seventh site there. So it looked something like this, where you have a uh, um, an extreme network in the in, in in the center across six different locations, and I think it was Foundry at the time on on the outer network, which was the London one, and a, a, say a seventh site. So we'd we'd expanded by 2000, I think six here to two lands, seven locations, 13 pops. So quite a quite a quite a growth for the links, but it. It wasn't actually until 2012, this is something almost tw you know, 20 years since we, since we started, that we, we got into a regional expansion and we, we had an initiative at the time, um, for those that remember that we were involved with Link. So John Souter was, was, was championing a, a regional initiative to try and see whether we can keep some traffic local across the UK. And so the, the, there was a push to open an exchange up in Manchester, <coughs> which it took a few years of, of growth in, in, in you know, sl fairly slow growth in the, in the beginning, but I think even this, this week we, we hit over 500 gig of traffic in Manchester. We got some, somewhere in the region 150 members up there. So, so as we look back on that today, it's, it's you know, fantastic progress for Manchester. But 2012 is when we launched it. We then, 2000, 2015, um, by, by then we'd done Scotland, Nova and Wales, um, which, which uh, were, were launched across three different years. We, uh, 2018, we saw the, the, the launch of JEDEX with the partnership with Centre 3 or STC, Saudi Telecom over in, in, in um, Saudi. We, we've recently, well, as, a, as recent as uh, 2021, we launched the um, Isle of Man IX as a managed service. And just last year, we expanded into, into Kenya, and we're in the process of building a second site in, in, in the Middle East, which is in, in Riyadh. So you can see uh, from a fairly, uh, a fairly quiet 20 years over the last sort of 10 years, and certainly uh, in the last five years, a lot of these sites have grown in number of pops. 
uh, there's been a lot of change in the network. So the way that we, we present on operational updates and projects, we, we reflected on and said we, we really need to change. I mean, today we run something like we, I, I, I looked across the, the, the footprint, we've got some, somewhere in the region of 50 buildings across 40 POPs in multiple countries running over 200 network devices. And so we want to make sure that when we present, we present the right information to the members around around these sites and so what so that's that's a little bit about the history of the footprint of why why we feel that we want to change a little uh, the, the the update to, to to you the other the other one the, the other bit of information i wanted to share with you is also some of the internal metrics that we 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 present on some of the metrics that we or the some of the the, the information that we share with the membership but also what we share internally as well so from an operational point of view and, um, and those that are on the ops channel or the or the um the the ops announce channel, the, the, the email um, lists, we'll, we'll, we'll be familiar with some of this. We, we typically, as an incident occurs, we set up an incident management team. This might be small or a large team, depending on the size and the impact of the incident. We then, we then um, the NOC, the Network Operations Centre with Sean, will uh, send regular updates onto the Ops Announce channel. And at some point, we'll send and we'll close down the incident and we'll post on RFO onto the onto the ops channel, and then someone like myself or, or Anne will stand up at a links meeting and give a bit of an explanation about the events. And for those that are interested, we have the, the portal, and you can look at service availability on the portal. And that's the way that we we've been working um, through through up and up until now. Uh, and and say so with the scale and, and and the size of the the networks now, we're finding that this this maybe isn't the best uh, way of uh, the only way of presenting. So internally. What happens at the same time as when we're going through this, we, we actually capture a lot of these incidents into our problem management database, and I'm sure similar processes happen at your, your organizations. We work with the likes of IP Infusion and Nokia and Juniper to, to, to identify those incidents. Often they become um, a Junos or, a, or a, 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 an operating system bug uh, update where we have to take a, a, a patch into our lab, test it out, and it might actually be weeks or months later after we saw that incident and we closed that incident down that we have a full analysis of what went, what went wrong or what, what happened there. So internally, we, we follow that all the way through. We have monthly reports where we present on incidents and problems uh, to the Lynx management team and to the Lynx board. And so the board, which you know is made up of um, executives and non-executives, so the NEDs that are re represented in the room, representing the, me the, the members, will see all of these reports and, the, and, and they'll, they'll hold us to uh, making sure we report uh, transparently on them. We also have objectives at the bottom there, so we have year-on-year -year objectives that we set ourselves, the board set of us, and we make sure that from a, a problem and incident reporting point of view that we uh, we perform, as we said that we would do at the beginning of the year. Now, not all of this information is, is, is readily available to the wider membership, and it's something that maybe we could start, um, start sharing a little bit more on. So what I, I expect is where, where we have had good feedback from so the surveys and we get feedback from the members on the surveys, the, the incidents that we t tend to talk about are the, that get, get um, more interest back from us are the, are the ones that are complicated, the ones that have, have had to have a, a additional investigation and then we, we present on that outcome and they tend to be the ones that get the, get the positive responses from, from, from the uh, surveys. So we would like to do more of that. The question is, how do we, how do we identify the ones that you, you really want us to stand up here and talk about and go into, technical, um, go into more technical detail? Well, hopefully, one of the mechanisms we want to leverage is the, uh, the new tools that we're going to be launching. So this is around the Lynx community. So you're going to hear, I think there's a 30, 20, 30 minute presentation tomorrow from Megan and Ricardo on this. Well, I, I, you know, I don't want to steal, steal the thunder for the, tomorrow's presentation, but um, you know, what, what we hope this is going to be a community interactive platform that you can log into, you get access to it from the portal. It means that you'll be able to um, you'll be able to get more insight into the network. You'll be able to join interest groups like um, the Ops and Outs channel or the Ops channel. You'll be able to join that Ops channel within the, the community. You'll be able to subscribe to posts. You'll be able to make posts yourself. You'll be able to analyze when uh, links engineers make posts. You'll be able to put comments. You'll be able to put, give some feedback. And hopefully what we're, we're looking for is to try and make that as interactive as possible. And then those uh, events or, or issues that have happened around the world that you feel uh, are most important to your, to your interests will we'll then put together presentations and probably bring them to events like this to, to do a formal presentation on. 
what that looks like. I just did a quick post myself, and when you get access to this, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to see this. So for, for in this example, since the last Lynx event, we've had five uh, incidents that have made it onto the Ops Announce channel. So those that follow that channel would have seen that. One of them was in Scotland, two on London one, one on London two, and the, the one I'm gonna speak about in a minute is the, uh, is the DDoS attack on our infrastructure, our, our external facing uh, infrastructure uh, that came, came through in January as well. So the idea being that we, I will make a post or somebody in engineering will make a post, we'll have this available on the Lynx community platform and then we can get feedback from the membership and then present on those that, um, that e either in an in a, uh, online um, presentation or a Lynx uh, event, we'll, we'll put, a, put, a, put a, um, something together for you. So hopefully you'll get access to this. You'll get a full presentation on the Lynx community tomorrow, and then you can have a play around with that. And uh, the idea is to make that as interactive as possible for everybody and hopefully get really good feedback for the engineering team on topics, not just incidents, but projects as, as well. And if you have any questions on Lynx community once, once uh, the presentation is made tomorrow, um, please do, do raise it with, uh, with the Lynx staff. Okay, so that's the reset on what we're going to do. We're going to be presenting slightly differently and, and using that platform to come and, and give you a little bit more information. Um, one of the incidents I want to talk about is, is the DDoS attack that we had in, in January. So the reason for mentioning this, it was reported in some media channels. Um, so this was an attack on Lynx's um, internet facing traffic, so it did impact our staff's access into VPN and some of the tooling, but we do, we do actually have a, a backup VPN access for, for these, these type of scenarios. This was on the back of the UK. If you remember at the time in January, the UK and the US were, took action against the Houthis rebel uh, forces for the, uh, some of the incidents that were going on in the Middle East. And in response, an activist group called Sudan, um, anonymous, decided to attack us and then claimed that they were um, impacting Lynx's infrastructure. None of the uh, member traffic was impacted in any, any, any way during, during the attack. The, uh, the incident started on Friday night on, uh, on the 12th of January. Um, the attack started around eight o'clock and we officially closed it down at six o'clock on the Saturday morning. So it started Friday night. I think a news reporter from The Sun, uh, obviously didn't have much to do on a Friday night, uh, picked up and, and contacted us for a comment, and we, we made no comment on, on that and, and uh, managed through. Because, because of, it wasn't a huge incident, but because of the media attention, we did open a, a video bridge and we had a number of people on the incident bridge that came through. The problem itself was a distributed a, a attack um, that was focused on a UDP flood. It was actually to the border routers themselves. So the border routers, we have three of them uh, with five, uh, three transit and two peering connections into our infrastructure for linked staff traffic. And uh, all, five in, all five ports and all three devices were being uh, flooded to, to cause uh, disruption to our capability to to, to get access to our systems. But internally, as I say, nothing was impacted on the network side and nothing was impacted on the performance of the, uh, the exchanges. One thing that we did pick up on, we, do, uh, we were, were able to um, software configure more capacity into the, into the infrastructure, which, which um, alleviated the problem. Um, but obviously throwing capacity at these problems doesn't always fix uh, the issue. So one of the things that we identified is looking at third party DDoS mitigation services to help uh, in, in, in the future. What did that look like? Just to show you where, where we were on that. So we had around eight o'clock, you can see there, uh, the links that flooded uh, at that point was when we opened the bridge. Uh, you can see around about 10, 11 o'clock at night, um, we'd increased capacity. And you can see then after that, we don't get the saturation. We, around one o'clock in the morning, we closed down the video bridge, deeming that uh, we, we no longer had a critical incident. And uh, as I say, Sean's team are 24 by seven, so they would have monitored that through to around about six o'clock, we de declared the incident over. I assume, you know, the, 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 the group that were, that were um, you know, focusing on us got bored, went on to a different target, and then we haven't seen the same, same problem since. Okay, so that was the only incident I want to talk about just before I move on to projects. Just quickly, if there's any questions. Okay. 
you still get a chance to ask questions online as well as we go through. So London One update, as I say, I gave a, uh, I gave a brief update on this at 11, links 119. Um, the goal here is to remove the legacy MX960 devices. So these are the Juniper devices that have served us very well over the last 10 plus years, um, but they, are starting, they have got to a point where they're, they're no longer bringing the value for the size and capacity that we, 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 see, we see London One Exchange grow. Um, through. So the project started back in 2003, but you're probably now seeing uh, 2023. You're probably now seeing 2024. A lot of the maintenance has come through. So I wanted to give an update on where we are. The goal here, we we want to replace that legacy technology with a new footprint, um, which maintains our size, our, 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 our physical footprint in the in the racks. It means we can deliver um, more capacity to the members reduce the, the power, reduce the uh, cost of supporting that capacity in, in terms of gigabits delivered to the, uh, to, to the membership. And hopefully in time, reducing the cost means that we can, um, we can return value to the membership, which ultimately is what we, we strive to do. So what does that look like? This is the network before we started on the project. You can hopefully see there, there's some light gray boxes dotted around, which are the MX960s. These are around about 13 of them in the network, supporting the um, everything from 110, 100 gig connectivity uh, across the, the, various, the various sites. The, the goal is to leverage um, both newer, new, um, newer, both uh, Juniper and Nokia devices to, to go into the network uh, as, as a replacement for the, for the 960s. We've, over the last two, three years and the 400 gig, we've proven out stability and confidence in having a multi-vendor network. And so we had a debate when we were going through the planning for this project, whether we would shift um, for one particular vendor or to keep the, the multi-vendor solution in place and the decision from the engineering team and, 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 and for, for us from a longer term design point of view was to keep multi-vendor in, in the network. And so we've invested in both um, new uh, Nokia devices and new Juniper devices to, um, to, to, to uh, complete this project. So Hopefully you've, you've seen through those that are following the maintenance you would have seen we've gone through. We've already done Telehouse West, we've done TCH, which is Harbour Exchange and the old, now Digital Realty, but the old Interaction site, IN2 as well. We've got maintenance is play, um, uh, planned for the rest of February as well, and we should be in a position by the end of February to remove five of the legacy MX96s as we move members off onto the, onto the newer boxes. Thereafter, I think March will be targeting uh, deployment of the new, the, the large um, Nokia device into Telehouse. So this will give us the ability to put the uh, high capacity FP5 cards in. Um, we'll then in April um, do migrations for RBS, the uh, TCM and TCA sites. And in May, we've got um, clear up in, in um, Telehouse East North 2, that THN, uh, TH2 is Telehouse North 2, and the uh, Equinix site EQ4. We have a little bit of an over, overrun into June uh, for snagging documentation. We'll have our next round of ISO readiness certification for in August, so we'll have June and July to just to make sure that um, we're in a good position for us to, to complete on those. And what it looks like in, 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 in terms of devices there is, is a, a little bit of a simplified um, topology, uh, obviously consolidation. These are much higher density boxes. We, where we've got the MX10Ks, we've inserted the, um, the new LC480 cards into those 10Ks so that we can put one and 10 gig customers onto them or member ports onto them. Um, where we've got the 10Ks uh, and the uh, SR7s, we'll be moving member connection, 100 gig um, connections off of the MX96s and onto either the MX10Ks or the, uh, the SR7s. And where we have uh, legacy MX10Ks at some of the remote smaller pops, we're replacing them with the, uh, the Nokia SR2s, which is a smaller form factor of the of, of the Nokia devices. We got a couple of flavors of the SR2s, the three terabit and six terabit, and this is just a, a licensing that you, you pay for on the, on, on the system for how much capacity you unlock as we go through. Each one of these solutions hopefully gives us the ability to um, upgrade and scale 
cost effectively as we go forward. It brings greater density and, and, and performance on a power per, per port delivered. And uh, over time, what we think we'll, we'll see is we'll, we'll be able to see the network grow. Uh, I mean, at the moment, I think it's around 40 terabits of access capacity for London One. We think on this footprint, it can grow to twice, twice that by installing uh, additional cards as we go through that. So it's somewhere in the region, 80, 80 terabits. So that's where we'll be probably by June um, with everything complete. You'll, you'll see the maintenance as, as we go through and, and we'll give an update at the link, next links meeting on that. And then finally, just on the root servers. So, re, you know, Mo unfortunately isn't here today. He's been traveling and, and he's, he's not been able to make it in today, but um, he's been working uh, on, on the root servers and, and, you know, with him and, and the team done fast, fantastic work as we've gone through that. We've always had the ambition um, to get back to uh, a dual root server setup, and um, we're one, um, one network or half a network away from that in London One. So we, we've now deployed open BGP D root servers across all of the networks except for London One. We're running the latest version of that, 8.3, and we've actually got 8.3 in the lab testing against the scale and size of, of, of London One, and we think uh, it, it, it should work for us. We've obviously got to do all the due diligence before we put it into production. But hopefully when we come to the next links meeting, we'll be able to give you positive feedback on rolling that out. Already London 2, from a size um, and a number of peers, is the largest network running on, on, the, on the new root server, the OpenBGPD root server. And we think with London 1, that will be a significant uh, step for, for, for links. As well as the uh, investment in the second root server, the OpenBGPD root server, we're going through a refresh on BIRD. So uh, Wales has been done. Scotland, London 2 and London 1 will follow very, very shortly. And once we've completed on those upgrades to the, the BIRD version 2, we'll be turning on the um, remotely triggered black hole um, product that Mike and the team have been working on, the engineering team working with Mike. And that will be released as soon as we complete all of the BIRD upgrades. And then finally, for those that use the Alice Looking Glass, we've done a, an update version to version 6. We tested that in the lab against BIRD version 2 and, and OpenBGP version 8.3, and that's uh, fully tested and approved for release. So we've just gone through the process of releasing um, Alice Looking Glass version 6. So um, that's it from me. That's the projects uh, I wanted to give an update on London One and, and on the root servers. And with the operational side of things, if there are ideas, once you get access to Link's community, we do want it to be interactive. Um, we feel it's going to be a better communication mechanism than the, the, the email lists that we, we broadcast on, on these things. So please do engage in that. And if you've got any ideas and, and how we can improve uh, the information we share with you, um, please do come and speak to me as well. And that's it from me. Any questions? Yes, just wait for a microphone, James. Thank you. Um, the real-time black hole feature, what device is actually going to not route the traffic and um, what changes do members need to do to accept the, the black hole routes into their networks if, if that's how it's proposed to go? Yeah, I, well, I don't whether the mic's got a I don't know, presentation line, but it's it's just the community-based the community-based uh, black hole, and so the um, the actual implementation on how we're enabling it for the product, I'll check with. And also, I guess the the next question is, do you validate that the existing best path is coming from the same place that the black hole route is coming from? I didn't quite catch that, James. So I, didn't. I think I heard a whisper yes behind me. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. That's... The answer is yes. So, so we still apply the same prefix validation um, on, on it. So, yes. I would hope so, yes. The same, basically, we, we do the same that we do on the root server, since obviously it used the root servers anyway. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions on Slido? Look, this is Tom's first links meeting and he's sitting there monitoring and nobody's raising and Give him a test question for next time. I also forgot to mention at the beginning that um, we've got about 50 odd people online as well watching the webcast. So hello to you guys too. And you can also ask questions via the 
the Slido QR code. So any more questions in the room? Tom, have you had a flood? No. Okay, right. well, Th thanks, Richard. Thank you. <laughs>